Welcome. Uh, my name is John Conti. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Baltimore, Maryland, and we are going to be talking about uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery today. Uh, I'd like uh, my co-panelists to introduce yourselves and please describe your clinical practice in the setting you practice in. I'm Robin Cohen. I'm an adult cardiothoracic surgeon. I work in Los Angeles at the USC Keck School of Medicine. Uh, my practice is mostly adult cardiac surgery and thoracic aortic surgery as well as uh, adult uh, lung cancer surgery. And I'm Todd Rosegard. I'm also an adult cardiac surgeon. I'm chair of uh, surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Well, I'd like to start off with really a simple question that may not be so simple to answer. Uh, Robin, what is minimally invasive cardiac surgery? Well, it's, I think that there's a big array. I think that, uh, unfortunately, minimally invasive cardiac surgery for us tends to be alternative incision cardiac surgery in the sense that we tend to do the same operation, though, via a different incision. I think that we haven't developed some of the technology that we really need to make it easier on cardiac surgeons, and sometimes that's the challenge, is, is, is by doing what we think may be easier on the patient, we're actually doing something that may be a little harder for ourselves. Todd, do you have the same outlook on minimally invasive cardiac surgery? Yeah, I think so. Usually minimally invasive surgery nowadays means minimally invasive for the patient and maximally invasive for the surgeon. Most of these procedures, uh, with the exception maybe of percutaneous interventions now, are technically more challenging, which is probably why a relatively small number of surgeons um, perform these operations. But as Robin said, um, typically a mini thoracotomy, a mini sternotomy is I think what most surgeons would define as minimally invasive. For valve surgery, we're not talking obviously about off-pump in most cases, um, mm -hmm. but, but clearly uh, for bypass surgery, you'd have to talk about off-pump as well. Yeah, I agree. Did you receive any formal minimally invasive training during your residency, or did you learn it afterwards? Yeah, I was, um, I'm old enough now to have uh, really had to figure it out on our own and, you know, either actually quite frankly through some of the uh, device companies were, were able to go to centers of excellence to uh, get trained. Um, and a lot of it, I think, is, you know, back in the day was really word of mouth and comparing notes with colleagues. Robin? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I, I was sort of, I'm old enough to have been around during the infancy, and I, I think that we, we saw a lot of what our mentors or what innovative people were doing, and we mimicked that, or we went to see them and saw how it was done. And uh, I think that it gave us the advantage of having the leeway to try everything, um, but at the same time, you know, make some mistakes and learn some lessons along the way. Uh, did you travel to watch certain people operate or to, to watch the experts or did you just kind of pick it up like Todd said at meetings and word of mouth? I traveled actually. I remember the first mid-cab meeting. It was in Oxford a long time ago. Did you go to that? I didn't but I remember it well. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I went to the Cleveland Clinic to see what Dr. Cosgrove was doing with his smaller incisions and then you know, from there, we were really on our own. What role, Todd, do you think the specialty society should uh, play in this? The society of Thoracic Surgeons, the AATS, the American College, what role should they play for practicing surgeons to learn minimally invasive techniques? Well, I think it's a whole nother world nowadays, and I think, you know, uh, I'm grateful, really, that the societies have gotten involved in between training sessions, uh, in-service sessions, sim labs, the like. It, it's a whole, whole nother world from what uh, Rob and I are alluding to back in the days of the Wild West, where we were having right, to have to yeah. figure it out on our own. I, I, I think it is very encouraging that we now have uh, both standards in terms of uh, um, gaining techni technical knowledge and uh, making sure there are, there are guidelines to help us um, yeah do these things that we didn't necessarily learn during residency. Robin, are there, are there any formal programs that you could recommend to a colleague who's mid-practice and really hasn't had the opportunity to start this yet? Yes, I, I think that there are a lot of different components to, to starting lesser invasive cardiac surgery in your practice. Uh, I think programs that combine didactics, simulation, and then some kind of support when you're ready to try it on your own is gonna be key. 
I think I, the most important thing is, are, are two things in my mind. Number one, I think that you have to decide in your mind how you're going to help your patient by trying a, less, a lesser invasive approach. And the second thing is making sure that it's going to be safe for them. Yeah. And I, and I agree, whether it's minimally invasive like we're talking about today or any new procedure that, that's really out of the box compared to what you're used to, not only do you need to go to some sort of formal training, but in addition, probably be in a circumstance where you can have a proctor on site, um, either one of your colleagues who, uh, in your practice sure. who's doing it, or you know, in many cases, uh, industry or, or, a, or a society in some cases will get someone, an expert from the outside in to help you. And I actually think that that's, that's actually probably critical at this stage. Yeah, I would also add to that that, you know, it's just not training us. You have to train the team, and you, that requires a change in the philosophy, uh, a change in the way you interact with your team. You know, there are a lot of skill sets um, where, as a surgeon, you can't just go into your room anymore and go, okay, I'm going to do it this way now. Your anesthesiologist, your assistants, your, your scrub techs, everybody has to be on board. They all have to believe that that's the right approach and they all have to be adequately right. trained to do it. Right. So Todd, when you made this paradigm shift, did you go from a standard operation to a mini operation or was there some intermediate step that you uh, went to before you became truly mini-mini? Yeah. So my area of focus for minimally invasive is mini thoracotomy. And you know, the good news or the bad news is that is a little bit like jumping off the deep end. It, it's, um, I think you have to see enough of them um, and be comfortable, comfortable enough with your own skill set in ter terms of technical ability. And again, having appropriate proctoring um, to be ready to do it. But for at least for a mini thoracotomy, you're, you're, you're sort of really all in. Now, the nice thing, and we'll hopefully talk about this a little bit, that for both mini sternotomy and mini thoracotomy, you've got a great and very, very safe bailout. And actually, that's what encouraged me to get into doing this procedure um, uh, back in the day when I started. So the conversion to full sternotomy is very easy to do. I've, I've had to do it on, on a few occasions. And that's, I think, where the, the comfort level is. And, and we may remember back to the day of heart port, right. um, which was not nearly as easily convertible. Um, and I can tell you that the, uh, the stress factor for the surgeon um, has certainly been a lot less for either mini sternotomy or mini thoracotomy compared to those um, less accessible procedures. Robin, when, when you made the shift, did you pick one procedure to concentrate on and once you mastered that, moved on to others or did you decide, I'm doing everything minimally invasively? Um, we didn't pick one thing. Uh, because I think that we realized that there were going to be different approaches to the aortic valve versus the mitral valve. And I think that it was tough uh, over the years to figure out which approaches those were going to be. Uh, I, I think most people went after some kind of mini sternotomy approach to the aortic valve and um, we didn't see the advantages of that because it was still a sternotomy, it still bled, it was still the same kind of exposure. Uh, so, you know, it turned out to be an, an anterior thoracotomy. So, uh, we really did experiment with a lot of things, and, and I think that fortunately a lot of that is laid out better for surgeons who are training to do it who are, or who are interested in doing it now. Yeah. And, I, and I would add, there, there are options. So, in this case, we're talking about mini sternotomy versus mm -hmm. mini thoracotomy. And one thing that was helpful, at least as, as I was selecting, was, was you have to see it. And one of my colleagues was doing mini sternotomy, and, and as Robin alluded to, it just didn't make sense to me um, for the reasons that Robin mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, so I didn't have to really do, do the uh, trial in a sense in my own practice. I was able right. to watch colleagues yeah. that helped me uh, make that decision. What role does video equipment or new technologies play in your ability to do minimally invasive surgery? Do you use any video equipment? Not as much as I would have thought we would be using 10 years ago. I mean, I really, I think that everybody would agree that so much of what you do depends on your ability to see. And our ability to see the mitral valve or to see the aortic valve through these small incisions is good. Right. The, the challenge becomes getting to them in the same way that we would have opened and, and as Todd alluded to, staying in our comfort zone. Right. You know, cardiac surgeons out of their comfort zone are in a danger zone. 
right. and, and, and I think it's really all about getting comfortable with what you're doing. And sometimes I have been and sometimes I haven't. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing I'd add is the one issue with, with the video equipment is if you're in a training si circumstance mm -hmm. and yeah. the, the, the Achilles heel, is, as we know, of uh, the mini, mini approach is it's a one, one person incision, only, yeah. only the operator can see it. So I think the role for video is if you do have trainees involved or conversely if you're allowing a trainee to do the operation, the video equipment gives you the, this, the safeguard of being able to see what's right. going on. Yeah, he's right about that, and also the ability of your team to see what right. you're right. doing. That's I think that's, that's an important yeah. thing. So how do we describe minimally invasive approaches to our patients? Do we just say, that's how I do it, or do we offer them the option of a standard approach versus a minimally invasive approach? I'm not sure what the best answer to that is. Um, I went for many years saying this is the way that we do it because I was committed to it. Uh, my team was committed to it, as were my colleagues. And I actually think that that's probably how you get the best at it, is to make it your routine. I've actually gone back to offering both to my patients because I think it's important. Uh, in, in my opinion, there are still some differences in safety. And I want the patients to know about them up front. I've done enough of them where I just want to know about the safety options up front and make a decision. And I've actually been surprised as to when I lay it out for them that way, about half of them will actually want the traditional approach. Uh, and I wouldn't say that that's the most popular approach among most surgeons. The one, the one thing I, I add, and similar to what Robin said, is the interesting part is in, in, some, in most circumstances, I've actually had to talk my patients down, so to speak, and that when they come in, they say, well, they say they want a minimally invasive operation, right. and I need to explain what it's not. So I have to explain that we are using the heart-lung machine. Yeah. We are going to stop the heart. <laughs> um, there is an incision. Um, you know, they unfortunately, and hopefully one thing that we'll be accomplishing with the, this outreach, is explaining to patients exactly what we're talking about right. when we talk about minimally invasive. They unfortunately think it's often some sort of magical, <laughs> no incision, no right. operation technique, and, and, uh, and obviously that, that's right. what it's not. Well, how about the referring cardiologists? Do they have an understanding of what minimally uh, invasive is? I, I would say it's almost the same conversation, and it's important. Wow. Uh, anything else, Robin? Uh, for the guy who's out there in practice and, and wants to get into minimally invasive surgery, I think all three of us kind of learned on our own. Uh, we looked at other colleagues. Uh, we've seen plenty of videos. We watched people and then started doing it. Is there any advice or encouragement that you would uh, give the practicing surgeon? Well, I think that we've covered most of the points. I think that it's, you know, the, the surgeon who starts a new approach has to be the leader of a team. And, uh, and as his team does, as his team succeeds, so will he. And, and so I think it's going to be a change of philosophy, a commitment to the philosophy, and having a team that's going to help you do it. In fact, uh, a lot of the, you brought up Hartport. Um, most Hartport programs failed. And the reason, I mean, obviously there were some technology reasons, but the big reason was is that they didn't do it with a team approach. Yeah, the one, the one thing I would say, though, is in, in uh, um, really to put a plug in, if you will, for minimally invasive surgery, I, I will say that um, you can do it safely. Um, in fact, the results, as we know in the literature, are very, yeah, very, very resoundingly as good, if not slightly better, than open approaches. Um, there is a significant comfort level. And, you know, quite honestly, I think when you finish a minimally invasive operation and you can say that you've repaired or replaced a valve, for example, through a two-inch incision, it's pretty cool, yeah. and uh, I think the patients are very satisfied, the family satisfied. You feel good that you've really done a great operation, and, and I think the staff in general feels that they've really done a service for the patients. So I think you have to go into it, you know, sort of really armed and well prepared, um, but in that context, I, I think it's a great new addition to what we can do. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, watching, and we hope uh, our comments have been helpful to you.